Okay, I think we're ready now. Excellent. Okay. Well, welcome everybody to the Monsoon Seminar Series uh, for this week. So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. And so today our speaker is our very own Peter Clift. And so Peter Clift has been the Charles D. McCord Professor of Petroleum Geology at Louisiana State University since 2012. He grew up in Southern England doing his BA at Oxford University and a PhD on Greek tectonics at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. After sailing on his first ocean drilling program cruise in 1990, he joined ODP in Texas A&M as a staff scientist in 1993 before moving to the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in 1995. In 2004, he became the Kilgore Professor of Geology at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. And since the late 1990s, he has worked on the geology of Asia, both on and offshore, especially focusing on the Arabian and, and South Chinese seas. He is a fellow of the Geological Society of America and in 2023 was awarded the Lyle Medal by the Geological Society of London. And so without further ado, I will hand it over to you, Peter, to tell us a little bit about the Asian marginal seas in the monsoon. Thank you very much, Tara. Let me share my screen and we'll get the show on the road. How does that look, everyone? Good, okay. So what I'd like to do today, hmm? Apart from making funny noises with my screen, I thought, anyway. Uh, what I want to do today is to talk through with you uh, some of the work that was done by a whole series of drilling legs. We're close now to the end of the, um, of the monsoon seminars, and it felt like a good way maybe to finish was to, uh, one, uh, was to talk about um, a, a sort of a summary. And so what I'm going to talk to you about here it was a synthesis of a bunch of legs uh, in a paper that was put together by myself and a whole host of other folk who uh, are noted here. Uh, and so off we go. If you want to read this um, uh, again, you can look at it. Uh, uh, there's an open access uh, publication in scientific drilling that came out last year uh, that essentially uh, summarizes what I'm going to talk to you about today. Let's see if I can get a laser pointer. Um, no? Oh, well. I thought, oh, hang about one sec. It's nice to have the pointer. Ah, the better. Okay. So what was the point of all this drilling? So one of the reasons that IODP decided to have a campaign of expeditions around the Western Pacific and uh, South Asia was to test models mostly developed by people like Peter Mona, who passed away last year. This idea that there is a strong coupling between the tectonic evolution of the Himalayas and Tibetan plateau and the development of the Asian monsoon system. The, the idea that plateau uplift might drive uh, intensified um, low pressure systems uh, in Central Asia and draw in moisture from the surrounding oceans. And in turn, that there might be a feedback there between um, rainfall like the mountain front and the erosion and therefore also the exhumation of high grade metamorphic rocks, particularly in the Himalaya. So we were interested, there's been a lot of uh, debate about that and we were curious to try and see if there was any evidence to substantiate that, these models. Um, certainly mo um, climate modeling has advanced uh, to the point where we have a more nuanced understanding of how the solid earth and the atmosphere interact. Uh, work uh, by Anta Chloe Saar, for example, in France has shown us how not only the Tibetan plateau, but also uplifting um, mountain ranges in East Africa, in Arabia, and in the Iranian plateau might act to steer moist uh, airstream in different directions um, towards the continental interior of Asia. And we wanted to see, uh, to develop, we can't test these models unless we have an understanding about how the monsoon evolves, as well as what we know from onshore concerning the tectonic evolution of these mountain ranges. 
And so this region was targeted uh, all across the entire monsoonal Asia. There was, of course, earlier drilling in these regions, such as in uh, the Oman margin, the southern Bengal fan, parts of the South China Sea. But a series of expeditions was launched in the mid 20 teens uh, that spanned Arabian Sea, Bengal, um, parts of the Nicobar fan here in uh, Indonesia, as well as the South China Sea <clears throat> and the Sea of Japan. And I'm going to, uh, there's a lot of work, dozens of people. So we, apologies if your work is not mentioned here. Um, you can blame me, but we can't talk about everything anyway. So, of course, the relationship between monsoon science and um, and scientific drilling goes back a long way, uh, really, to the drilling on the Oman margin uh, in the early 1990s, uh, when the understanding that this monsoon upwelling-related forum, Globigerina boloides, started to become much more abundant, starting around 8 million years ago. This was work that was pioneered by our uh, much lamented colleague Dick Kroon, who also passed away last year. Um, and uh, I particularly fondly remember Dick because he came to Edinburgh when I was a graduate student. And um, I knew that he was a big shot, but I, I didn't really know why. And I didn't know anything about the monsoon. So in many ways, he was an inspiration to me. So let's start in the Arabian Sea because it's the West and we're going to move East as the talk goes on. Um, and also, this is the expedition that I was on, so I know a little bit more about it. So what we were doing was drilling on the, the eastern side of the Indus Fan in a thing called the Laxmi Basin, which is separated from the regular part, the main bit of the Arabian Sea, by this little microcontinent, the Laxmi Ridge. You can see it on the seismic here. And we drilled uh, into the fill of the, of the Laxmi Basin um, here in a couple of places. Uh, was slightly disrupted by this, you can see this sort of homog this white looking thing in the seismic, that's a gigantic mass wasting deposit, uh, which uh, disrupted the nice sequence of turbidites that we had hoped to um, collect. Uh, nonetheless, <laughs> we were able to uh, derive a sort of an 11 million year record um, spanning uh, with some hiatuses, uh, particularly around 5 million years ago. But in many ways, we've got a, a record that went back uh, to around 11, which was enough, of course, to look at the transition here that Dick Kroon had meant seen years ago, as well as the trend uh, which, to more upwelling at that time, which also is a time of apparently reducing chemical weathering that we saw in southern China. So what do we see in uh, Expedition 355? This is a couple of the highlights. Uh, what we did see was uh, increasing evidence for drying of the environment, or at least the development of a dry season. These are proxies, these are spectral data, and we'll come back to this more later in the talk. Uh, these are the, in red and blue, the two sites that were drilled. And what you can see is essentially increasing abundance in, um, in hematite, which is sensitive to this particular wavelength, starting around 10 million, maybe peaking here. So of course, we've got our gap here, which doesn't help. And then you can see it beginning uh, quite variable, but high levels of hematite, particularly in the Pleistocene. The record of chemical weathering, which we thought might be related to, um, uh, to, to the environment, uh, you can see it's very scattered. And um, this is quite, seems to be quite typical of submarine fan deposits as opposed to hemipelagic ones, which are more, um, well, they're less variable. What we saw here was a, essentially a, a long-term decrease in chemical weathering, so less, less chemically altered material in the fan during, since the middle Miocene. Um, and then we did also see this transition in um, vegetation. Uh, this is um, leaf wax carbon isotope data, the work of, oh, I'm sorry, for, well, Sarah Feekins. Sarah Feekins is the blue person in the middle. And I, um, my, I obviously losing my marbles. I don't remember who did the green one right at the moment. But what you can see here is a, uh, an increase in Delta 13C around uh, eight to seven million years ago, quite close really to the transition that was picked out in uh, the late 1980s uh, in the Himalayan foreland in the Shualiks, 
but uh, essentially that is being interpreted as a transition from C3 to C4 vegetation here. And mostly uh, this is interpreted to indicate drying. Um, this drying uh, does seem to correlate somewhat with the increase of hematite. It doesn't seem to have much impact on the chemical weathering. Uh, I'm going to skip the one at the bottom because I don't understand it. So uh, we, what do we learn about where all the sediment is coming from? As we saw at the beginning, the channel flow model for Himalayan exhumation suggests there should be a relationship between monsoon strength and erosion patterns. And so what we did was to look at uh, neodymium and strontium isotopes to see whether there was any temporal variation. And uh, the Indus is a good place to do this because uh, it has extremely diverse source areas with very uh, positive epsilon neodymium sources in Kuristan and the Trans-Himalaya, Ladakh Batholith, even the Karakoram, and then very negative values down here in the Lesser Himalayas and in Manga Parbat, which is the Western Syntaxis. So when we plotted up all this data, together with some from an industrial borehole, what you see here was a track, a, gra a gradual track to more uh, positive values through time. We decided to exclude these most positive values because we thought they might be reflecting contamination <coughs> of the fan by direct erosion from the Indian Peninsula, and in particular, the Deccan Plateau. So we decided, I, I'm not entirely convinced that that was the right thing to do, but that's what we did. And so you can see this track here to more positive values until around seven or eight million years ago, followed by a decrease, particularly a decrease after around four million to the present day. And what this essentially suggests is uh, less Himalayan erosion up until around six or seven million years ago, followed by more Himalayan erosion. Um, and we're presumably here more erosion, oh, it's relative erosion. So potentially the Karakoram is becoming stronger here. And then especially after four million, the Himalayas become much, much more important. And we believe that this is likely related to the exhumation of the lesser Himalaya. We were able to look at that a little bit here. This is actually a rather simplified diagram. There's a better one in a more recent publication. Here we're looking at zircon data. These are detrital zircon values, or at least these ones in the red box are. And then below here, we have uh, various sources um, and the Indus Delta at different times. Uh, so what we see in the fan here, very simplified version, is that the blue stuff here, the very young values, are um, essentially correlate with the Karakoram, potentially with Keristan. Uh, we see these type of things in the modern river. So this tells us that these sediments did not come from peninsular India. They must be Indus derived. Uh, and you also see an, an increase both in the, the pink stuff that about a thousand million years ago. So that's typical of the Himalayas. And you will see also in yellow here an appearance of this much older peak at about 1.8 billion, which we see, yes, in the modern river. And where does it come from? Well, mostly from the inner Lesser Himalaya, the old cratonic basement of India. So this suggests to us that in the Western Himalaya, that the Lesser Himalaya only come to the surface quite recently in the last couple of million years, uh, which is somewhat younger than people have suggested from onshore work. Um, are they wrong? Probably not. It just means that the either the Himalayas were the lesser Himalayas were exposed earlier further to the east, or that they just didn't represent the bulk of the uh, sediment flow in the river. Oops, there's my little points. Uh, so we see some evidence for this lesser Himalayan exposure. That's probably what's driving this fall in the epsilon neodymium through time, this, which we also see in the zircons. This does not correlate with this sort of eight million year transition. These are the foreland data uh, here. So the, the drying happens before the change in the erosion pattern. We do see a long-term fall in erosion rates, both tracked by um, uh, fission track and argon argon on shore. These peak in the middle Miocene when the monsoon is strong. Um, and as the monsoon weakens, the erosion slows down. Why does the lesser Himalaya start doing their thing so recently? Um, that's not entirely clear. 
Um, and it may be that this is an example where the climate and the and the tectonics don't uh, interact very closely. Uh, this exhumation here is largely driven by imbrication uh, of the lesser Himalayan duplex and, and not because of intensification or weakening of monsoon. Uh, you can see this also, we tried unmixing it, the zircons using fancy software developed by these guys, Sundle and Sailor, that allowed us to break out the composition. This is just the zircon populations into these different critical uh, source areas. And you can see in green, there's the Karakoram, which is going away, and the Himalayas, which is increasing. The red is the lesser Himalayas here. So you can see actually the bulk of the sediment is coming from the Karakoram or the greater Himalayas, but that lesser Himalayan uh, uh, component is increasing through time. Uh, this is, actually doesn't represent a terribly good proxy for totally eroded amounts because it turns out that the Himalayan sources are super abundant, very fertile in zircon. So they tend by a factor of about two and a half. So the, the thickness of this is about two and a half times bigger than it should be, the blue. Um, it was, however, encouraging to think that there was some coupling between surface processes, monsoon modulated surface processes and tectonic evolution. This late exposure of the lesser Himalayas, for example, correlates quite well uh, with this cross section by Alex Webb uh, from Hong Kong, who shows here, there's the greater Himalayan slab here. So he has this still buried quite late on, which is uh, a deeply unpopular view uh, with many uh, Himalayan geologists. However, you can see the purple stuff. These are the inner lesser Himalaya. There's the duplex here in the modern day. And you can see this thing is coming to the surface at about the same time that we see it turning up in the Indus fan. This work was done in Northwest India and so should be comparable. And the, the two data sets match pretty well. Yeah, there it is, exposing. So enough Indus fan, let's talk a little bit more about uh, the Arabian Sea further south, uh, Expedition 359 uh, in the Maldives, the Inner Sea of the Maldives, which was based on this spectacular seismic profile. You don't have to be a great lover of carbonates to find this truly amazing, the development of this enormous asymmetric drift in the, in the Inner Sea of the Maldives. Um, which was um, imaged, and then one of the primary activities of the drilling was to try and date when this prograding wedge and the carbonate platform to the west switched over to this drift deposit that we link to um, the development of a strong monsoon wind system. And so what, we, what they were able to show was that uh, by drilling these contacts, they were able to show that the really strong seasonal winds uh, were developing about 13, just before or just after 13 million years ago. They also made two points. One was that the rapid onset, this real switch change here, suggests that <clears throat> it was probably not just tectonics, which tends to work on a much slower pacing. So the, the change in the wind, and I think it's important to remember we are talking about wind and not rainfall here, but the wind is not only being driven by the tectonics, um, and you can see also uh, that after the mid Miocene climatic optimum, we have this cooling uh, and together with uh, the fact that the continent is getting more drier and colder, that it establishes this um, bipolar ocean circulation uh, that has essentially prevailed since that time. It is interesting to note that the climatic record from the Maldives here um, is hard to reconcile with the erosion story I just told you from the west northwest Himalaya, uh, and is one of many examples of where it's been very difficult to reconcile marine and terrestrial proxies. Let's go a little bit further east into the Bay of Bengal. There were two expeditions in the Bay of Bengal, uh, 353. Uh, once they had escaped uh, their captivity by the Indian Navy, they were able to um, to get permission to drill. Uh, they drilled a couple of sites on the uh, on the Eastern Indian margin, uh, one site in the Bengal Fan, uh, one on the old re-drilling section on the 90 East Ridge, and two here in the Andamans. 
And uh, in particular, I guess I found uh, this one pretty interesting because what they were showing uh, was an increase in the clay mineral abundance. You can see it sort of particularly down here. So in this brown curve here, that it's going, the clay mineral content is going up starting about 13, 14 million years ago, actually quite similar to the moldy change as well, right? <clears throat> and assuming that this, um, the content of clay minerals on the Anite East Ridge is a proxy for discharge from the Bengal Delta up here. It suggests um, a sharp increase in erosion starting in the mid Miocene and essentially increasing up until uh, the Playa Pleistocene, which is sort of different again from what we saw in the Arabian Sea. Um, there are a number of other proxies here that indicate changes of try to monitor changes in source and chemical weathering, um, things like smectite and kaolinite. You can see the kaolinite going down through time, so less and less tropical weathering, maybe a slight decrease in the smectite, but then it's coming up again. Uh, there's no real clear trend in chemical weathering visible in the Bengal fan, as far as we can see. Uh, but we do know from the isotope compositions, um, things like lead isotopes, in the that they there was essentially a consistent source of sediments, mostly from the Himalayas, either directly from the Himalayas or potentially recycled through the Indo-Burman ranges, and that this pattern of erosion, this source of erosion, has been going on for at least a lot the last twenty-seven million years. The oldest stuff at the bottom of their drilled sites was carbonate. So, whether there was no fan before then or whether the sedimentation was in a different place is not entirely clear, but we do know uh, that the, it's at least that old. And they also was a, able to ascertain that the dry winter monsoon uh, began its operations sometime in the mid to late Miocene. Uh, the other fan drilling was in the central Bay of Bengal. Um, I always think it's testimony to the size of the Bengal fan that um, although this is described as central Bay of Bengal, of course it's east of Colombo, Sri Lanka. So it's actually quite a long way from the delta. It's just a long way from the toe of the fan as well. The strategy here is to drill a transect so that each of the drill sites, uh, when put together, would provide a continuous sedimentation record. And it was arranged along this very beautiful seismic interpretation uh, done by Volkhard Spies and his students in Bremen. Uh, and of course, they were able to look at mass accumulation rates in each of these wells maybe not the best regional indicator of sediment supply, but at least it's a start. And you can see, again, it's picking up here, certainly after 18, and then again, stronger after 12. Um, we do know, again, the sediments that were drilled along this transect had rutile and zircon fission tract that imply derivation from the greater Himalayas, which were rapidly exhuming in the mid Miocene, uh, but then those slowed down. Um, so one of the curiosities about the Bengal fan that we don't see in the Indus is the influence of the eastern syntaxis up here. This is uh, Namche Bawa, and, and there was, um, it has been argued by uh, this expedition's scientists that the uh, starting about 5.6 million years ago, there was a shortening of the lag times between the thermochronometers and their depositional ages, which is interpreted as an acceleration of exhumation in the sources. And they tied this particularly to Namche Bawa because the modern Brahmaputra uh, comprises <coughs> about 70% of its bed load or of its total load is coming from the Eastern Syntaxis in the way that the Western Syntaxis does not dominate the Indus fan. If we look at the sedimentation rates uh, from this paper by Kevin Pickering and colleagues, Again, you can see there's a little bit of activity earlier on, and he's combining here the Nicobar fan, um, the Sumatra drilling, uh, um, which was able to sample the eastern side of the Bengal fan. We know that part of the Bengal fan is on uh, down over here. It's just separated by 90 East Ridge. And so what they were suggesting was, uh, again, a sort of an increase starting about 13, 14 million years ago. Uh, and then various peaks, uh, whether they're important or not, it's a bit difficult to know <clears throat> without uh, seismic coverage because you don't know whether the boreholes themselves are representative of the entire 
um, the entire fan or not. Uh, there were some efforts to look at this uh, about changing erosion rates, which ought to be coupled to monsoon activity. Uh, this study by Lennard et al. Um, used cosmogenic beryllium-10, uh, and they looked uh, back at Bengal fan sediments stretching back to about just over 6 million years ago. Uh, and so what they do is use the cosmogenic isotope to look at the erosion rate in the dominant sources, presumably the Himalaya. And what they argued here with, with a few sort of eccentric uh, um, excursions here, we see essentially pretty steady state erosion of about one millimeter a year that's been going on since about six million years ago. Um, so that if that's right, and you can see they've zoomed up, they've got a lot of information here just during the Pleistocene. Uh, again, pretty steady state here, despite all the climatic variability of the Pleistocene. And so they uh, argued that um, the climatic variability that we see in the Pleistocene and indeed what appears to be drying through the mid since the late Miocene uh, does not uh, impact the erosional regime, at least not in the eastern and central Himalaya. Of course, if maybe if, if this is dominated by the eastern syntaxis, maybe it's just telling you about the eastern syntaxis. So there was some work here done by Pascal Heuger and colleagues uh, looking at appetite fission track from the Bengal fan. Uh, what they've plotted here are depositional ages against the fission track central age. And this dashed red line here, the one to one line, uh, that shows you if, if they plot very close to there, then we know that the exhumation is essentially really rapid. Anything that plots over here just means it's been reset. What she's got here are gray dots here from onshore, from the Shivalix. Um, and then uh, the, the, the blue uh, are, are the Bengal fan samples. So I guess these are still within error. It does show very rapid exhumation here from a, starting about 15 million years ago, or at least starting no later than 15 million years ago, continuing up until about six, then maybe a slight decrease, but uh, you can see pretty, sh um, pretty uh, short lag times, maybe a little bit of a decrease, but consistent with what we see in the modern rivers in the central and eastern Himalaya today. So again, actually, if you think that the monsoon has been changing its strength at this time, and I guess I do, that there doesn't seem to be a lot of impact on the erosion rates that are going on in the source regions to the Bengal fan. Oops. Just for kicks, you can see how this compares uh, with the Arabian Sea. So this is slightly different. Instead of using the dashed line to show you the zero lag time in this study by Peng Zhou, one of my former students, he just calculated the lag time. So essentially, these are all reset over here. Um, anything you can't anything that's you can't have a negative lag time. You can't. Uh, and his data was in, in the red here. So again, what we were showing, or what he was arguing here was that in this time, around seven, eight million years ago, that we see a shortening of the lag times, the zero lag times, mostly plot between seven <clears throat> and six million years ago, which you may remember is also the time of the climatic and vegetation transition we saw in the Shiwalex. Uh, the lag times are still pretty short here, and they are comparable to things that we've seen in the Bengal fan. Uh, but uh, they seem to reach a peak at that time. So there is a bit of variability here. Uh, and this probably reflects the fact that, the, that the, the Western Himalayas are essentially on the edge of the Asian monsoon and may be more sensitive to changes in the rainfall that have a direct impact on the erosion rates in the way that we do not see in the Bengal fan. Um, what else do we see here? Well, zircon work was done in the Bengal fan too. And of course, they, what they showed was derivation from a variety of sources from um, essentially from, uh, this would be, uh, let me see, these are Himalayan sources here. And they're comparing here with the modern Ganges and Brahmaputra. Um, essentially, what they showed is that there wasn't a great deal of temporal variability what they really saw is that some of the turbidites were coming directly from the Ganges, and some of them were coming directly from the Brahmaputra, and some of them reflected mixing. And that, that was tied up with the uplift of the Shillong Plateau on shore, which was diverting the Brahmaputra towards the west through time. 
but there was no there was no clear exhumation of new sources uh, seen in this record in the way that we did see in Arabian Sea. Uh, likewise, essentially, in the, the Nicobar fan work by Lisa McNeil and colleagues over here on the other side of the 90 East Ridge shows this rapid sedimentation. They don't have any sedimentation in the Nicobar fan until about 9.5 million years ago. After that time, it's Himalayan, basically. So um, this is believed to be as a result of the diversion of the flow linked again to the uplift of the Shillong Plateau and also the westward growth of the Indo-Burman accretionary prism here, which is deriving a lot of sediment, which uh, you can see this little map over here, how uh, the sediment is being diverted onto the east side of 90 East Ridge, accumulating in the Nicobar fan um, after about 9, 10 million years ago. And then as the as this uh, ridge comes into collision with the with the subduction zone here, that that gaze is closed off. And then subsequently, we've had sedimentation only on the west side, on the Bengal fan. Uh, it is interesting to think about that impact of uh, tectonics and the wet climate around the eastern syntax is the Namche Bawa. This is fish and track, zircon fish and track work done by Gladys Govan with uh, Yanni Neyman in, um, in uh, Lancaster, England. And uh, what she shows, this is onshore work, but it's interesting to note that so her lag times, which is very helpfully uh, labeled for us here, that they reduce from being about 5 million. Uh, prior to 7 million years ago, and that they shortened substantially at that time. So they were arguing that Namche Bawa may become much more influential over the eastern part of the Himalaya, starting here in the uh, late Miocene. Let's move east again here, now to the South China Sea. There was an earlier expedition in uh, 2014, 349, uh, and then two later ones, um, a few years after that, uh, the focus of these uh, expeditions was tectonic, uh, but nonetheless, they were give us opportunity, they have to draw the sediment cover as well, so they were able to look at the um, uh, impact of chemical weathering on the South China Sea, and in particular to the Pearl River, um, largely sourced from southern China. And in the earlier work, actually dating from the late 1990s, we had a record again of the hematite, gertite, the drier versus wetter conditions here. That suggested a sort of a peak uh, seasonality here in the mid Miocene, decreasing uh, into the Pliocene, and then maybe rebounding a little bit up here. Uh, at the same time, we see falling degrees of chemical weathering. The chemical index of alteration here is seen to decrease, so less weathered material. That's also similar to what we saw in the Indus fan. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, you can also see that this falling here, this drying, correlates very much with uh, the, the changes seen in the Lus Plateau. So here, this is magnetic susceptibility related to a stronger East Asian summer monsoon. There is a peak here in the mid Miocene that we see in many of the records. And then high degrees of variability, the strongest uh, monsoon records we see in northeast China, uh, starting in the Pliocene. This humidity index from southern China, again, that's consistent with this wet phase that we see uh, in southern China. Uh, again, also correlating with, with pollen data uh, from the Les Plateau. So we see a dry period and then again a rebound here in the Pleistocene, we get much more variability, dry and wet phases. Um, right. And uh, the reduced chemical weathering, we believe is mostly tied to uh, a cooling of the global climate rather than um, particularly a drying of the monsoon. Um, let's go further east again, northeast into the Sea of Japan. Uh, a lot of the work that was done here focused on the oceanography of the Sea of Japan uh, in these series of sites here on the eastern side of the basin. Um, one of the highlights here was um, that uh, they were able to look at the carbon isotope composition of black carbon in the sediments, and that they correlated that with an expansion of C4, so the grassy flora in Central Asia that's being blown into the blown into the basin on westerly winds uh, and that this change in the vegetation correlates with um, 
the late Miocene global cooling. Uh, looking at the origin of that windblown dust, not just the organic material, what you can see is an increase, you see in the yellow here, increasing influx from the Chinese Lus Plateau, which is beginning around eight to nine million years ago, but becoming really strong here in the last five million. I mean, variable, but much more, much stronger, mostly at, at the expense of dust from the Taklimakan Desert in Western China. So this is telling us a lot more about monsoon winds and the westerly jet blowing material from arid Central Asia that's drying up as the Himalayan uh, range and the Tibetan plateau produce this giant rain shadow that we see today. And clearly the activity of the, of the Lurs plateau becoming more and more important. The expeditions also ventured south of the equator into Australia, where um, I have to say I don't entirely understand what's going on, but I'll do my best. They drilled on the western, northwestern margin of uh, the Australian continent. It's affected by the Lewin current, as well as partly by the, the Indonesian through flow, which is known to be important in controlling the aridity or um, uh, of uh, the Australian interior. So the drilling here did show <clears throat> there is a sort of a gradual uh, decrease in um, in humidity through time. That's actually ones from Eastern Australia, but we see similar things uh, in the West. Uh, it's interesting that we see this period, particularly in the Northwest, of uh, a weakened Indonesian through flow, that it correlates with the, with um, uh, with a phase of rapid erosion from the from the continent, so they see this deltaic phase uh, where there's more runoff in northwest Australia. You can see here in the Pliocene, which is actually, of course, mostly a rather dry period in many of the records that I've shown you up to this point. Uh, we also see a change in the pollen, uh, essentially a decrease in the amount of trees uh, and more grassland, especially accelerating at the beginning of the Pleistocene in Northwest Australia. But Australia appears to be doing its sort of own thing. This wet phase is unusual uh, compared to what we saw in Asia. And this likely reflects, first of all, the drift of Australia north into the tropics, as well as, of course, the pinching out of the, of the, of the Indonesian through flow as Australia begins to collide with Indonesia and building the big mountains in um, Papua New Guinea. So what do we end up with? Uh, it's all, in many ways, it's rather confusing, really. So I'd love to tell you a nice, simple story, uh, but the, unfortunately, that's not, no, that's not the way the monsoon works. So um, what we do see is in the Arabian Sea sort of drying, there may be a slightly wetter phase in here. There's a common transition from C3 to C4, but it's not always at the same time in all the different basins. Seems to be earlier in the Northwest Himalaya and later uh, elsewhere. We see, as you say, I just saw the increase in flux from the Lurs Plateau uh, into the Japan Sea uh, in Southwest Asia. We didn't touch this too much. Uh, Indochina, um, essentially the Mekong, we again see an increase in hematite uh, going along with more grassy um, uh, floor, uh, pollen uh, in that area. So it's an, again a drying in Indochina, what, what we might see is actually this appears to be slightly the reverse of the signal that we see in southern China. And then um, apart from the drying in the in the in the Pleistocene, actually Australia having a sort of a, a decoupled relationship. So we made some progress. This is essentially a summary of what has been drilled up to this time. So what you can see is we've got quite a lot of sort of Miocene to recent sections now with a few ex with a few places that we don't know much about, like East China Sea. It is interesting to note that actually very few of these sections go back into the Paleogene. Or, and so we know that the greater Himalayas were beginning to exhume uh, in the uh, starting in the early Miocene. Very few of our records cross that boundary and none of them get back to the start of the India-Asia collision or the postulated start of the monsoon in the Eocene based on terrestrial records. Um, so a good start, but a lot, a lot of missing information here. And some of these are actually extremely condensed sections. So for example, 
there is some oligocene in the Bay of Angol that has been recovered, but it's mostly pelagic carbonate and doesn't really tell you much about evolving conditions in Asia. Uh, we do know that we've actually we made a good start here on the carbonate records uh, in the Maldives, and it's encouraging perhaps we should look more at that in the future at the Lacadives or the Mascarene Plateau, or of course the carbonate reefs in the South China Sea. So more recently, I've been trying to have a look uh, at color data from across monsoonal Asia um, and just trying to compare like with like. Uh, this is this um, spectral uh, proxy, the hematite gertite that I touched on before. Uh, this is my Indus fan data uh, where we saw this drying up section. So I've colored this so the more yellowy, ready looking colors should be more hematite, presumably drier or at least more seasonal. Um, this is our record from South China, which is remarkably well behaved. You can see how the fan is much more scattered. Uh, South China Sea, much more hemipelagic, gives you a much smoother record. Uh, Northwest, uh, sorry, Eastern Australia gives a record, but it appears to, this shows the opposite to what we see in Southern China. Right? This is becoming drier. This one appears to be getting wetter. Um, we also see that the Mekong is, is not behaving in the same way at all. So as this is falling, but the Mekong is coming up. So it seems like Southeast Asia, Indochina might be slightly out of phase with Southern China. Uh, of course, you can probably see the complete mess that is the Bengal fan. And the reason that that is, looks like that is not because the Bengal fan is insane. It's because the data collection during the cruise didn't work properly. So if somebody has a, a few weeks on their hands, they should probably go back to the repository and rescan that. The, the, they had the wrong bulb in their device, basically. We can look about this a little easier if you just look at the redness factor in the sediment. Um, so that can be a nice indicator. It turns out that the redness, that's a pretty reliable proxy. Um, it's a pretty, uh, sorry, it's a very reliable measurement and it mostly correlates with the hematite gertites. We get similar sort of patterns in places like South China Sea and in the Mekong, you can see here. Uh, what jumps out at me here is actually that the 90 East Ridge gives a very nice record where we have very high values, very red sediments here in the middle Miocene decreasing. So in many ways, actually 90 East Ridge is looking a little bit like the South China Sea um, with a peak in the mid Miocene and then a drop. It's a little bit earlier. The fall uh, appears to be earlier, starting about 13 million in the Bay of Bengal and a little bit later in the Pearl River, but uh, not so different. Um, if there's any data from the Bengal fan, it's, it doesn't look like there's much variability. Uh, it is interesting how resistant to climate change the weathering and erosion systems in the Bengal fan are. Uh, and we can also look, of course, again, correlate with Australia here, Northwest Australia and Eastern Australia. They seem to be doing their own sort of thing. Eastern Australia seems much more variable, getting much, much more dry in the Playa Pleistocene. Uh, I'd say it's a bit like the Mekong, but it's the opposite of many of these other Asian records. So I haven't really uh, entirely understood quite what's going on here. This is only submitted. I'll probably get a bunch of rude comments on this. Um, and now I think actually uh, I've actually scheduled too much here. So I'm just going to skip through. What I wanted to, talk, to note is that we'd use some of this data here to look at chemical weathering in the Himalayas using the approach that Christian Franz Lenord and Lou Derry uh, did. And the punchline here is that the total weathering flux that we saw in the Arabian Sea and the South China Sea, pretty flat in the South China Sea, where, whereas it tends to decrease in the Indus. And of course, the total weathering flux is what we believe may be reducing atmospheric CO2 and has been invoked as one of the primary drivers of global cooling in the neogene. And so the result of this paper was that we think that that's not really true, that the total weathering flux in the that we can measure from the Tibetan plateau and or at least in the northwest Himalayas is not going up, it's going down. So the Himalayas are critical to the evolution of the Asian monsoon, but they may not be critical to the evolution of global climate. Uh, what is? Well, we're not really sure, but maybe New Guinea may be more important. And 
recently there's been efforts to explore the idea of drilling in the Gulf of Papua uh, with what ship is not terribly clear at the moment, but um, we will try and see how that goes. But it may be that other regions rather than the Himalaya are being critical in this point. So I don't want to talk, I, I do have slides, but we don't have time to go over that. I think it's better if I skip to the end here. See, amateur, I should have known better. Let me, so what did I show you? I hope I showed you that there was drying in many areas um, <clears throat> since about 10 million years ago in monsoonal Asia, that Asia is different from Northwest Australia, which has this wet pulse in the Pleistocene, Pliocene, uh, so there's somewhat of a decoupling here between Australian and Asian monsoons, and that's probably reflecting the the influence that the Indonesian through flow has in Australia, and, but not in Asia. Uh, there may be this reverse um, or mirrored climatic evolution between southern China and Indochina, uh, maybe because of the migration of the ITCZ towards the north, uh, since the late Miocene that brings moisture into southern China while letting Indochina dry. Uh, we did note that the drying trends, they're similar in many places, but they're not synchronous. So like the Indus Basin tends to dry earlier and shows that C3 to C4 transition around 7 million, but it's later in Indochina and later again in the Ganges Basin. Um, the Taklimakan, well, that's quite old, but it gets drier and drier. Uh, through time, nonetheless, its impact on the wind-blown dust is going down because the Chinese Lewis Plateau becomes more important, especially since the Pliocene. So the, the extent of drying in Central Asia is increasing. Uh, and so this is consistent with the idea that Asian topography, it's not entirely driving the rainfall by any means. What it's doing is steering the moisture inland and focusing the precipitation. So the total amount of rainfall appears to be much more linked to the global temperatures, but the, the mountain ranges, the Himalayas, but also Iran and East Africa are pushing the rainfall in different directions. So that's why the rainfall indices do not always correlate with the marine productivity records. But yeah, so the weaker monsoon is essentially correlating the globe with global cooling start, uh, since uh, certainly at least the middle Miocene. Yeah, so this is the reason that these oceanographic proxies don't correlate with those for continental rainfall. They're not measuring the same thing and they're not driven by the same processes. Yeah, so yeah, Himalayan Asia is not driving global cooling, uh, but maybe New Guinea or other parts of, in, of the Indonesia or Philippines may be critical. So maybe I will stop at this point and take any questions. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Peter. Um, we'll let everybody uh, take a moment to put together some questions in chat. Um, or you can also raise your hand digitally and I can call on you for that. Um, let's see, make sure I can get the gallery view up here. Well, I certainly agree with the comment in the chat that without Dick Croon, a lot of this would never have happened. With, without him sort of getting the ball rolling in the early 1990s and then his tireless work on the IODP review panels and uh, helping that process, we would certainly not be in the state we are today. I, it seems like you've wowed everybody with uh, the plethora of monsoon proxies across there. Asian marginal seas. <laughs> yeah, well, you you can go. Scientific drilling is open access, so if you want to look at that summary again at less wild speed, you can go and download that. Uh, if you can't find it, you can always uh, send me an email. I'll post you a copy. Um, email you a copy. Um, but yes, so we've done a lot and there is still a bunch to do. Uh, maybe some of it, at least in the short and medium term, can be achieved through the ongoing uh, drilling that we hope to do with the mission specific platforms operated by ECORD and maybe even a little bit of stuff with our Japanese colleagues in uh, with, uh, uh, with the Chikyu. Unfortunately, Jody's resolution won't be in East Asia anytime soon. 
Well, this is uh, more of a comment uh, than, uh, again, we'll wait for people to ask questions and things. Um, but I enjoyed the fact that you uh, were highlighting that there's this disparity, um, especially between the, the various proxies, especially like winds and rainfall, because I think maybe in the last few years in the community, people have started to realize that that leads to a lot of uh, confusion um, and also kind of um, highlights or maybe uh, merits uh, further study for what we mean by the monsoon, I guess. Like, uh, I know some of these studies that you touched on, like, you know, proto-monsoon, paleo-monsoon, you know, and the effect of uh, seasonality and how strong seasonality is and how well represented that is in the records. So, yeah, anyway. One thing I thought was interesting, especially in South Asian fans, was a comparison with the Foreland Basin and the fan records, which were not always the same. Um, and that's not to say that one study had made a mess of it and the other one had got it right, but rather that you've got a, like a proximal record and an amalgamated distal record. And the two together are quite instructive. So that may be something that would be worth looking at further in the future. Good point. Yeah. All right, I see that there is a question from Ushtin. Yeah. Uh, so Ushtin, would you like to read out your question? I see that you're on a phone, so I'm not sure if you could do that, but I can also read out your question in the chat. Yeah, I, I don't know if you can hear me. I'm at a swimming pool <laughs> We're picking up my children. So maybe, maybe uh, it was really just a comment that, um, yeah, this would make a great, you mentioned New Guinea, I think would make a great uh, location for, for an MSP proposal. And there, there are certainly opportunities for that at the moment. Um, so it wasn't really a question. Um, great presentation, very complicated, but uh, oh, yeah, no, that's, still, that's a question. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, of course, as you know, there were also monsoonal proposals to study Sunda Shelf, uh, which will be interesting because as, as you, as I was alluding to, the climatic evolution in Indochina appears to be a little bit different from what we see in southern China. So um, knowing more about the erosion and weathering and climate history of the Sunda Shelf is also something that we could address in the short term, or at least in the medium term. I don't think anything happens in the short term with ocean drilling. I see that there's a question in chat from Catherine Badgley. Catherine, would you like to ask your question out loud? Um, let me see. Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, uh, great. Well, Peter, thank you for that wonderful summary. I found it really fascinating. And it makes a lot of sense to me that there's so many regional differences because, of course, that's the way, that's the, way the world is today. And there's no reason that it wouldn't be that way in the past. Mm -hmm. But I'm um, having read, you know, I work mainly, as you know, in the Sawalik record of Pakistan, where uh -huh. we've had, um, we've had, um, we, we've been very interested in um, the, in, in evidence without maybe a clear um, answer, what is the evidence for either the monsoon being a present, strong or weak? And you showed so many different proxies from these different marine records. I'm curious what, um, because I've read papers, you know, some people saying, oh no, there was no early monsoon, early Miocene or middle Miocene monsoon. It didn't get started until later. And then others say, oh yes, it did. And I'm curious, um, can we be confident whether it's in the um, Foreland Basin record or these marine records of any particular proxy saying, yes, the monsoon was present. The South Asian monsoon was present at this time because this variable is of this value. So, yeah, well, that's a good question, of course. And it, I think at the start, we would just have to say, well, what are you, what's the most critical um, thing for you? If it's wind and marine productivity, the answer is going to be different than if, well, you're a Shawalek person. So you're probably more interested in rainfall and of course, right, we'd need. be interested in the seasonal, the seasonal, so the, how seasonal the rainfall signal yeah, is, right. whether we're getting, for example, most of the rainfall in three months of the year or whether it's, you know, whether it's more distributed over the entire year. Right. So um, that's the things that I 
found, which I thought have been quite useful in terms of seasonality, have been things like hematite, because you need a dry season to form hematite. Uh, and also things, some of the clay minerals like smectite and kaolinite. So kaolinite is much more tropical, much more like humidity through the year, whereas smectite is favoring, smectite formation for, favors a much more seasonal climate. And I just want to actually make the point. So I find like whenever I talk about smectite, everybody tells me it comes from volcanic rocks. And it can, of course. Some of the rivers draining volcanic areas are full of smectite. But the, the modern the modern foreland basin of the Indus is chock full of smectite. And the, it is not a volcanic district. So we know that that, why is it developed like that in the recent soils and the Holocene of the Indus? Well, it's probably this really seasonal climate. I mean, like Northwest India and Pakistan in particular, when they're right on the edge of the monsoon, that's probably why they show bigger fluctuations compared to the Bengal. I suspect that like the Brahmaputra and much of the Ganges is essentially wet a lot. I mean, all you know, even when it gets wetter or drier, it doesn't get super dry and it doesn't get that wet, whereas the Northwest Himalayan foreland really feels those changes. So if, if I was going to pick a favorite proxy, it might be that, like hematite, gertite or smectite abundance. Um, yeah, at least if you want to look at chemical weathering in a seasonal setting, um, I guess if you're interested in erosion, erosion rates are complicated. Um, I mean, we can use these thermochronometers. I have to say, I find them a little bit confusing sometimes. And how we reconcile this with things like the beryllium isotopes, I'm not sure, actually. Maybe I suspect that the beryllium isotopes being flat in the ben Bengal fan probably just means that the, the Himalayas are in a steady state there. You can't erode more quickly than the rock is uplifting, and not over long periods of time anyway. Thank so, you, Peter. And of course, we can, to some degree, estimate erosion rates by our sediment accumulation rates where we are, too. And we do yeah. see changes in those over time. Right. Well, thank you but, very much. In the marine setting, we need the seismics, really. I see that, Sergio Ando, you have your hand up. Would you like to ask your question? Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Hi, Peter. Thank you very much for your great summary. It was really amazing to see so many proxy applied to try to understand these very complex systems in a so wide area. I'm just asking you, because you have applied a different proxy, we have seen also other proxy that you published in other papers, I'm really wondering, because you tried the bulk methods, the single grain methods, uh, all proxy that are applied for provenance studies in these uh, study areas. And what do you think? I mean, do you believe that uh, other proxy can be useful to better constrain the provenance of the sediments and other... Why? Other ideas that uh, there is no time to show everything can be useful uh, in this investigation? Well, I, I feel like probably a combination of proxies is the best. So, I mean, for example, much as I love zircon, zircon works nicely in the Himal in the Indus because the Indus has this variation between the, the Karakoram and the Himalaya. But it doesn't, you can't resolve the outer lesser Himalaya, from the greater Himalaya, from the Tethian Himalaya, they've all got the same zircon, it's useless. Um, in this case, and the neodymium will be the same as well. So in this case, things like heavy minerals or diagnostic minerals for high-grade metamorphic sources would be more important. So, I, you know, zircon is good, but it's not a magic bullet. And it's actually, if you want to, the only bit of that I was commenting on the lesser Himalayans coming to the surface in the Indus, but it was only the inner lesser Himalaya, the very metamorphic stuff, the oldest material. But the, the rest of the Himalayas are all the same flavor with zircon. So we need people who can tell us, well, when does the kyanite or the selimanite appear in the foreland basin or the, or the fan? We wouldn't, that would give us a better resolution. I'm even a little bit skeptical about argon-argon. It's a good job 
Yanni Neyman's not here to kill me. Uh, <laughs> but I feel like bits of the Hymenta, for example, also have Argon ages, which are the same as the Greater Himalaya. So it, that's useful as well, but it feels like it's not as diagnostic as a nice, like, selimanite brain. So, yeah. It's, yeah. But, but sorry, Peter, I have another short question. But what's next? So now, I mean, you presented this nice summary, but, you know, we love our minerals and we love to dig into our sediments. So what do you, what do you want to do for, for the future now? Tell well, us. I <laughs> uh, well, I'm interested in, in the Sunda Shelf, really, and uh, Southeast Asia appears to be uh, something that might be interesting. Uh, it's a less well understood zone. It's this transition zone between the East and the South Asian monsoons. And it's also something we might be able to address practically, either through field work or through the mission-specific platform scientific drilling offshore. Um, you know, if the Joides resolution or its replacement really do disappear for 10 years or more, um, well, it may not come back soon enough for me to get much done before I'm, uh, before I retire or something. So um, that, that's my feeling is at least for the next five or 10 years, let's look at Southeast Asia. And I think that's, from, that's the frontier now. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Okay, well, I think we've uh, co um, commented on Peter's presentation and uh, um, basically uh, bugged him with a few questions here uh, enough. Um, so please put together your physical hands and your digital hands for our speaker for today. Um, and so before all of you run away, um, we've had a slight change to our monsoon seminar um, in the next coming uh, two weeks where instead of next week having a monsoon seminar, it'll actually be two weeks until we have our next monsoon seminar. And so please join us on the 17th for Schedule B um, for Yogaraj Banerjee, uh, who will tell us about the Indo-Australia monsoon. So I hope to see you all then, because I think I'm host that day, I should double check. Um, but in, that, in any case, uh, I hope you have a good rest of your morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. And I will see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you again, Peter. Thank you, Tara. And thank you, everyone, for coming.